So they're starting to use lab-grown human brains to work as kind of a form of next-gen artificial intelligence. I'll explain exactly what that means, but it's a bit weird. These are actual human brain cells that are being grown on top of uh, different digital like circuitry to be able to control different models and play different video games. It's a bit weird to see kind of what's going on there. The company that most of this research is coming out of is called Cortical Labs. Uh, this is their website. It's nice, uh, but the name <laughs> to me, and I don't know, it's because I'm already kind of feel a bit uneasy about this whole thing. Cortical Labs seems like something out of 007 or maybe even Austin Powers. Like this is the sort of villain thing. Um, but this is their illustration of what's going on. They're growing these human neurons on top of these kind of chips and they're using allowing the neurons to be able to get inputs from the chips and send out signals so it's able to kind of play in this digital environment an actual human sort of uh sort of biological neural network that's what they're called uh, it reminds me of that part of the matrix where they're harvesting these people's bodies to generate power but instead maybe there's some sort of dystopian future where they have these instead of a server room they have all these brains and drawers uh, that's not exactly what they'd be used for i explain why i think they would be used and what their kind of use is but i don't know all this just seems so dystopian uh but here's uh uh here's the publication and here's kind of a diagram of what it looks like they take this kind of circuitry uh they grow uh these human neurons on top of it so they call it like a brain in a dish but they grow these human neurons on top of this and it's able to intake information uh, from the from the game, and it's also able to output uh, information, meaning it can move this little slider. So it's playing this pong game. This brain learns to play this pong game uh, by being able to interact with this sort of digital circuitry of, that it's grown on top of. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a bit it's it's a bit crazy to me, a bit surreal, kind of seeing this and seeing if this develops much further. Because right now we're, we have OpenAI and we're developing uh, transformer models that people are kind of seeing how kind of intelligent they are. And there are even you know, debates about uh, Ilya Sutskova from OpenAI is saying that there's like sparks of a consciousness in even what we have now with ChatGPT4. But could you imagine something like this? How could you argue that this isn't the same as our consciousness if it's a built up version of this? Uh, the other one just seems like matrix multiplication so it's like i don't know a lot more deniability there but i think this is a bit more weird they've also got these things to play games like doom and other things but one thing that really interests me is that they these are reinforcement models so how do you make the make it want to play this game well if it knows nothing about pong why how would you teach it to play it you know so they have some sort of reward system. They punish this fake brain or reward this fake brain. And they kind of just briefly mentioned it in the paper, but I, I look back to kind of see the beginning of this. And they found I found this paper from 2001. Uh, and this is kind of how they incentivize the network. So this is predictability modulates human brain response to reward. So this is kind of where they found a lot of this out. Uh, I can sum this down into something very simple, which is these human neurons they like predictable uh, sort of uh, inputs. Uh, so they were testing out uh, on these neurons, they were cycling uh, different inputs of uh, having water, juice, water, juice with like regular intervals in there. Uh, and they liked that. Uh, but conversely, if you had like randomized kind of intervals and randomized patterns, uh, the neurons did not like this kind of uh, input. So this would be the kind of punishment and this would be the reward for the network. So if it if it was doing good in Pong, you gave it the, the good pattern. If it did bad, you give it the crazy pattern. Uh, the interesting thing about this study that they point out here though, is that the subjects, the actual people, couldn't identify which one they preferred like consistently. But the fMRI showed that the brain uh, consistently preferred the, the predictable patterns. Uh, but the patients all kind of had different ideas or couldn't really specify. So it's kind of interesting that the person was kind of a little bit disconnected from what the brain was kind of feeling. So I want to talk about more why, like why this. ChatGPT4 seems to be working good. People are developing so fast in that area. Why are we going down this route that seems like so weirdly ethical and, I don't know, a bit strange? What's the benefit? Well, you these systems are very... Uh, efficient is one thing they also interface really well with organic other things so 
Uh, this could work really well with Neuralink, possibly. Uh, you could imagine why. It's like a human-on-human -human connector. You're, you're making some sort of uh, merge between... Uh, you have these lab-grown interface that connects it to a digital interface that may connect to your actual brain. It'd be weird if you have some sort of augmentations in the future where people are able to like add on to their their own brain, add additional, you know, neurons that may help things. May it'll, it'll definitely get weird. I'm 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 positive of that, but they're very efficient. That's the main thing. So what's the what what's this efficiency kind of for? Is that it would be very good in robotics, where you have stuff that needs to function fast, not take up that much power. These sort of things. Uh, that are very good. The reason that we're built the way that we are, you would want to build a robot very similarly if you had something that actually interacted in the world. A little bit different than how ChatGPT is built. But anyway, here's traditional machine learning. It's nice. It's uh, differentiable. You can use back propagation very easily. Uh, and let me explain kind of what's going on here. I'm going to wait for this thing to kind of spin back around. But this is a multi-layer perceptron. And this is examples of the uh, MNIST data set. So these are hand-drawn images of numbers. Uh, these are all the pixels of the images. Uh, the white is like where someone drew and then the black represents just the blank part. Those That's images input into this network and it predicts some sort of class on the outside. So you can see it predicting different classes right here. And then that's the input. So this gives you an idea of kind of what's going on and just traditional machine learning. And then here's a spiking neural network. This has a kind of a domain of time. They're not differentiable like uh, traditional machine learning is, and they see the images multiple times to kind of simulate uh, seeing it over time. And uh, to be able to get a, like an activation from one of these neurons, it has to have multiple spikes back to back uh, within a, sh a certain amount of time, and then it activates. And you can see there's a lot less action going on. And a spike neural network is an SSN. It's very a little bit different than the, the lab-grown brain, which is like a BNN, a biological neural network. Uh, but it's much more similar to a actual biological neural network than traditional machine learning. And the reason is that it's, it's this effectiveness in sort of like being low energy. Uh, and you can kind of see this here. And I think what I want to do is talk about these spiking neural networks because they're so related to these biological neural networks and they're kind of more explainable to us. There's a lot of stuff about the human brain that we're just learning. We just learned a lot recently about the different activations within like different parts of the dendrite. Uh, but anyway, uh, spike neural networks, I can just talk a little bit more about that uh, and what they are. So differing from uh, traditional machine learning, they have a time domain of their, their kind of activations. Uh, this paper is very interesting. Um, this is kind of their having a part of this uh, rat's brain that they're kind of analyzing. And they're able to pick up these kind of uh, activations within the brain of this rat. Anytime it smells something, it has these different outputs in the brain. And if it has multiple activations back to back through time, if you have enough, you can generate a spike. And that spike gets propagated through the network. And if you propagate through the network, you can eventually get out some sort of prediction of a type of smell based off of a particular set of activations through time. So that's the main difference is that time domain. There's a lot of issues that come with that because it makes things not differentiable. There's a lot of issues that come up, a lot of things that, to address and so on, but they're very interesting. And I think they're gonna be a big part of robotics in general, like actual robots that interface with the world. Uh, here I have kind of like just basic code for a spiking neural network. If you're interested, I would say this is a great place to start. If you've just done some sort of machine learning and you're interested in getting into spiking neural networks, I'll post this on my GitHub. I'll be in this video. You can just look in the description. I'll have the place to get this. Uh, but this is pretty good for trying that data set. What it's doing is it, these images are not through time. There's no time domain in the MNIST data set. So it takes the image and the gray pixels have some probability of showing up. The absolute like white pixels, so like the really bright parts of the, the image are always there. And then the kind of gray ones have some probability of showing up. So this is what a image through time would look like that's fed into a spike neural network of one single image of five. Uh, this is kind of like a, an old way of doing this. This is like the first sort of version of these kind of spike neural networks. But if you really want to see kind of more of the cutting edge stuff, you need to go to this Slayer uh, library. 
spike layer uh, air reassignment. Uh, it's very good. Uh, this is kind of like, I guess I say cutting edge. Like this is what all, all the researchers in this field are kind of using, or I'd say most. Um, you can go down and this stuff's very interesting. There's this gesture uh, sort of uh, data set that it's able to look at. And it's very good at predicting different gestures or so different motions. So this is obviously some sort of time domain task. They're very good and very efficient at this. And I'll get in a little bit more into like why they're good at this sort of time domain. But definitely check this out. This is very interesting. Uh, so this is kind of goes back to that time domain. This is a uh, thousand FPS spike in neural network working on dynamic vision sensors. So a dynamic vision sensor, that's what this is here. So you can see uh, it's sensing only movement. So it sees that sort of black and uh, green and red image that you saw there. Very similar to actually what you saw up here from this Slayer thing. These are the type of images that it sees. So if we go back here, you can kind of see it's seeing this sort of movement. Uh, similar to what they used to think about T-Rexes, I think around the time of the Jurassic Park series, they were like, in the movies, they're like, don't move because if you move, that's when they see you, you know. Uh, they, I think they had this idea, even though if that were the case, you can just move the sensor or the head of the T-Rex and he could see everything just fine. Uh, but anyway, uh, tangential, uh, but very interesting that they're able to work at a thousand frame per second. I mean, most people know like 60 frame per second for imagery is like fast. And like most detectors, object detectors, this sort of thing, trackers, they work at maybe high is like 60 really 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 high like super fast is 100 frames per second but you're not you're not getting anywhere near a thousand frames per second on typical detectors uh, so this is the publication here uh, this is kind of about it i'm gonna have some more about this sort of thing as well as adding additional code for spiking neural networks so if this is something you're interested in uh, i would subscribe and if you like this video at all uh, i would like this video just to help uh, the algorithm thank you